Uh, I'm going to be showing Cody example, so it's my need to see it. So, um, oh, do I press the red button? I think Joe, red button, we need red. Yes, yeah, just hold that down. Sorry. <laughs> no, here we go. Good. That's it? That's it. Cool. That's, that's, that's the so, I kind of want to start by talking about some of my motivation for this, because at the, at the end of the last talk I gave, Mark was like, this is all cool, but um, how much of this is applicable? And I thought about it for a moment, I was like, really none of it, because it was, it was a lot of theoretical stuff. So I'm trying to do the complete opposite, where something you can kind of take to everyday coding when you sit down and to kind of change it. Um, when I was looking up clean code talks for Northwest JavaScript, I saw that Todd gave a like a talk about a year ago on clean code, um, and I thought it was fantastic. Uh, I'm actually gonna be echoing a lot of what you're saying, but the one thing um, I wanted to kind of do is, he was giving uh, general overviews. I kind of wanted to dig in to talk about why those are good practices, and then also kind of get into talking about um, how, well, how you can change code so it's more clearly readable and better. I also, just by the nature of clean code, um, I feel like there's gonna be some disagreement. So honestly, feel free to, call me out or disagree with me and say, well, I think that's ugly. There's a way better way to do that. Um, so we're going to start very first with some poorly written code. I'm going to put it up for a minute, and I want you guys to just call out anything you see that's pretty bad about this. Some people may recognize this function. I'll, I'll be well. Stay with us. Yeah. <laughs> it's an example of poorly written code. Um, Any chance you can zoom out? There should so be a space after the floor loop. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's the branch. Yeah, it doesn't look good. Um, can everyone see that? Or is there, is there a way to zoom up on? Can you add like, no, uh, Control no. Shift Plus. Oh, you're in. Are you in? Are I'm you in PowerPoint? No, I'm not. I'm in uh, Google Slides. Then no, not really. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then page is way off. We could. Uh, you have, like, you move the projector? You have like a billion oh, parameters. Give me a favor. Yeah. That's yeah. definitely a problem. Box, there. Pull that uh, white. <laughs> the thing that projectors on. Pull, pull it back. Like a little reference. Yes. Wow. Oh my god, it's so big! <laughs> <laughs> okay, never mind. And I mean, the day. It 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 there, so. And do stuff tells you exactly what it's doing. And that's the best part of this function. <laughs> it's a well named function. Um, there's a lot wrong here. Uh, I've kind of highlighted uh, roughly 10 things that make it bad. I mean, it was constantly reading, writing to global variables. Um, there were way too many parameters. Some of the parameters weren't even used, if you didn't notice. Um, there are things were terribly named. Do stuff doesn't tell you anything about it. Um, what's that? Riddled with the function keyword. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's no use of lambdas there. Kind of um, an abuse of lambdas, should I say, or anonymous functions. Um, magic numbers were thrown around everywhere, 12, 4, 100. The coding style gave me a headache to look at. Some things were indented more and less, and that for loop was terrible to look at. So uh, the kind of thing to take away from this is there's no one characteristic that makes code really bad. It's usually, it's usually a bunch of things that come together to make it just a nightmare to read. And so it's, when, when you look at like a function like that, it's kind of hard to start when you need to edit it or to fix it to be like, well, what, I mean, there's no dialect to how the function flows. So it's kind of hard to pick out what you need to do in order to fix it. So these are just some kind of smells that I also kind of <coughs> put up there. So to kind of generalize what the problems were, boiling in variables and functions, there was inconsistent coding styles, it was overly complicated, global variables, um, too much trying to do in one line. I had that, I had like a map of a map of a filter that's, <laughs> Good luck trying to edit that, so that's where the bug is. Um, and there was a bunch of comments that just really did nothing. Like, you know, if the expense type is one, the subtract one, and just the function signature, just do stuff. Like, these comments just add noise. Um, they don't really do anything. So, if bad code is defined as being something that's difficult to read and maintain, um, then you can't just say that good code is just something that's readable and maintainable. Um, but it, it's kind of, it's not helpful to say, well, just don't write bad code. Um, it's like telling someone who's a bad driver to say, oh, just be a better driver. It's like, well, what exactly is my problem with driving? So 
the goal of this talk I really wanted to go into was look at some principles that can be followed to help us write readable and maintainable code. And then I also wanted to kind of go another layer under that to kind of talk about why these principles help in maintaining code and readability. I think good code is it's really easily written and it looks very straightforward. It's composable and module, it's simple, it's readable, um, and it really looks like the language was made to solve the problem. That's when I, I think of like the Doom 3 source code. I don't know anything about game programming, but I can follow that and it's just very clean and easily written. I think an analogy to kind of make with uh, coding is coding, I, I've heard it once that coding is like billiards, where if you watch a really good billiards player, they kind of set up the, like when you watch them, they're not taking these like crazy shots. They're all very easy shots. And at, on the face of it, you can be like, well, what's really so, that's not so difficult. But they're actually setting up the cue ball in every shot so that they never have to take the hard shot. They're always taking the easy shots. And when I think about good code, it's doing that. You're basically trying to set up a domain and like an environment where the, you're really easily able to like you're really easily able to spell out what the solution is, and you're not trying to do trick shots when you're writing code. I think this is particularly interesting with JavaScript because there are so many tools available in JavaScript, and they keep adding more features. And these are great features, and I think I I can't wait to see what they do. I can't see I can't wait to see what else they add. But at the same time, it can kind of make it a nightmare when you're editing someone else's code because it's kind of the newest feature and it doesn't really play into the rest of the body of, the, of either the function or it doesn't play into the rest of the code base. And so I feel like you really end up with these weird problems where people are trying to jam like that map map like filter. Like it, it's nice and concise, but it's really hard to read and really hard to debug. So to first start, I kind of wanted to go over what good naming practices are because um, that's really the heart of a lot of programming is basically having good names that are descriptive that actually help you. So I think it's also a good thing to kind of think about what the purpose of a good name is. Like, the name is there to help you. I mean, a lot of times you have things, you're trying to juggle multiple concepts in your head, and you really want to kind of have the names do the work for you, so I don't have to memorize, like, I don't want to memorize the memory addresses when I'm working with something. I want, like, a nice description. I'm like, oh yeah, this is the expense, cool. So. I think clear names help with the mental load of juggling multiple variables. Um, multiple names, um, if you have multiple names, you wanna make sure that they're pronounceable and you wanna make sure that they don't look kinda of similar. I have worked on something that uses both applicant and application and that is a terrible thing to program with. And they also really help express the intention of someone else who's reading it, which I think is the main thing. So I kinda of wanna take a look at some examples of code and look at how we can make them better, um, basically by reducing, like, or yeah, not being redundant, um, by making clear names and by being consistent and making sure that the names spell our intention. So, I mean, in this function, um, you have an example of, I mean, PWD, that one's kind of self-explanatory, but I've come across things that are like CNTR. I don't know what that means. Um, I do think also that the I mean, there's a lot of redundancy too with new user, because um, we have user. So, I mean, just on the face of it, does anyone think of anything we could do to kind of fix this or to make it better? I may have done that, or I may not have done it. There was, I guess I would have gone with user instead of new user, right? It's pretty yeah. clear you just knew them off, right? <laughs> exactly, yeah. Um, that's actually, that's one of the things I did. I mean, new user is really redundant. I know it's a new user based on the function definition, I heard the name. Yeah. Uh, we don't need to say user ID to your name. Yeah. You know, user. Uh, also, process payment for user. Uh, actually, not much complicated. I, um, well, I actually I did all three of those. Um, I, I agree, because you can tell what we're processing the payment for. It's by the user. If my name is well defined, then I don't need to say for user. There could be a different namespace where you have like process payment for client or um, customer, and somehow your customer differs from the client. But for the most part, um, I think it's much better and much clearer if you have the name kind of speak for itself when you're passing it to a function such as this. Um, this is a really bad offender, which I come across a lot. Um, what's wrong with these three functions for user? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, the, the verb is inconsistent here. Um, 
and it really makes it hard if you're trying to work with some kind of API where it's just like it's fetch for A, but it's get for B. So this is a really clear fix. This is just go ahead and use get or fetch or grab. I've never seen grab really. Do. <laughs> this is also kind of speaking to using um, bad names. So I mean, clearly the problem here is just that the variables are really poorly named. I mean, I, I don't know. What is A and what is zero? You can kind of guess based on what the prompt is. But even then, it's not really clear. So just naming goes a really long way when you're trying to express the intent of what you're trying to do. Um, the, the key point I really wanted to get here is that the name, like the definitions of the variables are really what's doing all the work here and explaining it. it. It literally makes all the difference in trying to understand this code. Because you can pretty much speak you can speak though. If you said that out loud, yeah. it makes sense what you're trying to accomplish in that if statement, for example, versus your previous if statement. Yeah, for sure. I I guess I can take a minute here to also talk about, um, I, I mean, this isn't to say go ahead and go through all your for loops and rename i to iterator. I mean, there are definitely some like common conventions that people understand. I think those should definitely be adhered to. Um, I mean, especially if you have to type out iterator every time you're incrementing i or what have you, or working with i. But for the most part, you should really let the vari like the naming of your variables do the work for you in explaining it. So to kind of recap this naming portion, um, you want to make sure that the name reveals the intention in your code. You want to avoid redundancy in your names, so such as new user and just using user instead. Um, names that are pronounceable definitely help. For example, like what you were saying, where you can kind of speak it as like common English. And using one word per concept is also a very good practice. That way um, you're not having like this fetch and grab. So, so this next one is, I kind of want to talk about functions here. So I feel like a lot of stuff, people have heard a lot on, I feel like I'm not saying anything new when it comes to functions. Um, Todd had a lot of this in his talk, basically. Um, what makes it a good? long time ago, and a lot of these people weren't there. Sure. So um, I'm basically uh, echoing what he said. So about a year ago, he was basically saying that um, good functions basically uh, have descriptive names, are few in arguments, and are small. Um, you used a quote, I think, from Uncle Bob, where it's like, a function does one thing and only one thing. Right. It's yeah. a sort of canonical quote about functions. Yeah. Function should do one thing, should do it only, basically. Yeah, it should be. Except for the side effects. <clears throat> Except for the side effects. <laughs> I, I will get yeah. the side effects in a little bit. Um, I put an ideal function here because I'm really talking about ideal. Ideally, it has no side effects, but I mean, you need side effects at the end of the day. Um, if you have no side effects and you run your program, you just press a button on a box and it starts shaking and smoking. Like it, it needs to do something <laughs> useful for us. Um, but so ideally, you want to have no side effects. Um, but I will kind of get into where you kind of work side effects in. Um, I also think that uh, ideal, ideally, a function should only descend one level in abstraction. You shouldn't really go into details. If you need to go into more details of how to actually. Um, of how that function should work, I think those should actually be broken up into more functions as well. Um, so that you're really so only working at those levels of abstraction. Yeah. So to speak, this is all leading to object-oriented way of programming, you know, concept, right? Mm -hmm. So small not functions, not necessarily. I'm, I'm going the function route. <laughs> uh, well, they wouldn't need to get rid of the whole I mean, these are all concepts. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how people do functional I programming. Will. How you maybe ideally want to. Well, I'm really happy you're actually bringing that up because I'm going to talk about that too. Um, because I feel like when people, well, I'll get there when I get to kind of functional programming. Um, so, yeah, these things are nothing new. We've all read them. But I think it's good to pause for a minute and talk about why these are positive features for a function to have. And I actually just quoted John Carmack here because I think he had a really good point when talking about it. He said, a large fraction of flaws in software development are due to programmers not fully understanding all the possible states that the code may execute in. Programming in a functional style makes the state presented to your code explicit, which makes it easier to reason about. And the, the kind of gets to the point of, it should, of having no side effects is the idea is that you can control the environment that your code is executing in, as opposed to trying to manage the state while it's executing. So. So this kind of gets to what you're saying about um, having everything be concise. I feel like functional programming definitely has that 
stigma of being super concise and hard to read. And, um, and that's also why I kind of snuck in in that first example. I had that terrible function of like map a map of like filter with lambdas. That makes it really difficult to read. And I, it definitely can hurt your readability. And I don't think that you should just kind of be throwing them off willy nilly. Um, yeah, of course. Okay, so just for the stupid of us in this room, sure. what's a lambda? Lambda, so a lambda is, uh, for, let's just go with uh, JavaScript. Uh, you can call a lambda an anonymous function. So in that very first slide, I had a function that basically was not named, and it took a, a set of parameters, and well, it doesn't have to return something, but it takes a set of, it's an anonymous function. It doesn't have a name, and it can also be passed as an argument to okay. other functions. A lambda is basically, you can just think of it for this purpose as an anonymous function. Okay. Are you happy? Okay. Yep, Bill. No. Okay. That works. Cool. So, um, that first example I had, um, had a really bad use of lambdas. It was just basically functions. That was, uh, that was the complaint. It was just, I just had a lot of the word function written everywhere and just a bunch of arguments that were being passed around. It's really hard to read, really hard to debug. And I don't think that just I don't want people to think that functional programming is just using lambdas in there. I think when people first hear like a functional programming, they kind of start looking about it and like, oh, cool. What, what does this have to do with helping like with helping me write better software? And so they look things up and oh yeah, lambda calculus and monads and monoids, great. And then they kind of just disregard it. They're like, oh, this is hard to read. I don't know what I'm doing. I, I think the when people talk about functional programming and they talk about the advantages of it, they want to talk about the strengths of it are the fact that it minimizes state. And going back to that John Carmack quote, he was basically talking about how state is a large, not knowing how your code is running leads to a lot of bugs. And so if we can minimize the state or the mutation of state, it can help us reason about our code. And so by using some, some kind of functional practices, we can actually minimize the state and better understand and reason our code, which is exactly what we want to do when we're writing clean code. Um, when people talk about functional programming, to kind of get to the gist of it, is that um, by treating functions as mathematical functions, um, we can be more confident in their correctness by not relying on external state. So every time we basically run in these, when we're trying to run a function that has some sort of state, we have to make sure the state is always, it's hard to reproduce. I'll, I'll show you in a minute here. So when people talk about having something that's reproducible, or <laughs> I think this is really the key of functional programming that people want to get at is that when you talk about pure functions, um, it's you want to write so you don't have side effects. And this is what I meant by ideal, because a pure function is a function where the return value is only determined by its input values. So there's no state that it reads from or that it modifies. This is really good because you then don't have to worry about reproducing the state and you can be confident it's going to work that way. You can take a function, I'm going to show one in a minute, but you can take a pure function, run it with the same inputs a million times, and you can get the same output a million times. You can be confident that it's not reading like, oh, well, I'm going to multiply this by 2 in this case because the state says to call it by 2 instead of some pure value within there. So uh, to kind of reiterate those, the, the benefits of pure functions are that they're testable, they're reusable in a new environment without trying to copy the state, and they're easier to maintain, they're easier to understand. So consider this function. This is, a, this is a pure function because it doesn't rely on any external state. It takes in one argument and it returns an argument. I can pass two in here as many times as I want. I'm just going to get four. This is the way the function works. But I don't have to worry on some external state or some way that the program could be running in. So, so this one is the pure, right? Yes, this is a pure function. Uh, it's pure because the return value is just determined by its input value. We're mapping something from a domain to a codomain here. Um, oh, yeah, this is being we're running a million times. It's going to say the same thing. So the reason that pure functions are considered good is because they help with something called referential transparency. So in mathematics, when people say that um, something has referential transparency, they're meaning that you can replace the value in, uh, you can replace a function's call with the value that it would output. And this really helps when you're trying to figure out what the program's behavior is. This is how you can kind of write more modular code and better code without worrying about the effects or the 
you don't have to worry about the, any side effects that may come with it. Um, you, don't, you won't change the code's behavior. So the idea of pure functions within, um, within functional programming is that they're trying to model um, mathematical functions as closely as possible. Because in mathematics, things don't have side effects. But it's really easy to reason about things in a mathematical way. So the problem comes in when you're starting to do um, programming is you need some like you need some type of user interaction and interface. So at some point you're going to start interacting with a keyboard and displaying things to a screen. And at that point you can't really do pure things because there's going to be a side effect. I mean, the state of what is outputted on your screen is going to be determined by what's already on the screen. And so you can run a function a million times that's not pure and it's going to give it could potentially give you any number of outputs. So. One thing to think about when you're thinking about or when you're writing functions is you have the core logic be as pure as possible, and you try to push your side effects to the outside as much as possible. So that way, the core of your system and the core of your program is as pure as possible, and it's easier to re reason about. And then you have on the side all your side effects. So if our function is referen referentially transparent, then we can be sure that this runs properly no matter when the function is called or how it's called. Double is double. It's going back to that function I had earlier. If I had some kind of state-based version of it, uh, where I have kind of an object, um, you have to make sure that the state is the same in order to get the same outputs. This is much harder to test than that one, because in this one, you always have to make sure the state is the same. And on top of that, if you want to copy it, you have to make sure the state is copied as well. Whereas the one on the left is much easier to not only reason about and much easier to test, but you don't have to worry about its state. You just know that double is just going to double in every case. Um, this is one more kind of um, side thing, which I see. So this is an example of um, flag statement. And there's definitely problems with flag statements. Um, this is kind of shifting gears a little bit away from the pure function things. But um, flag statements, flags are bad because if you have a flag, it usually means you're trying to do too much in one function. Um, so one thing to do here is you can kind of break out the two, uh, the flag into two separate calls, and then it's up it's the responsibility of the caller to determine which one you use, rather than just passing in the value of the boolean here. So part of what I want you to take away from just this part, which I feel like it was important to kind of stress is that flag statements usually are are breaking that principle of trying to do one thing well. You're trying to do two things in one. So uh, some quick tips about writing functions is use descriptive names, um, reduce mutating state as much as possible, and like, like I said, trying to push the side effects more to the outside. Uh, minimize the amount of parameters that you are passing in, and do one thing well. Uh, I always like to think of this. Uh, if your function has the word and in the name of it, you're probably trying to do too much. Or if you have the word or in it, it you're probably passing a flag of some kind. Or, yeah, and that's just never good. Hey, Robert. Yeah. Can you go back to that last example? Yes. <clears throat> so I heard what you said, and I think what you said makes total sense, but I'm thinking about it in <coughs> practical terms. Mm -hmm. And to do it the way on the right, like you're saying, you're letting the, the consumer, whoever's using these functions, figure out which one they want to call. Yeah. But you created such a specific example that's not a mathematical equation, save user or save new user. Right, it's not. I kind of wonder, like in that example, it should be the uh, responsibility of the save user function to figure out what you're doing and maybe call an external function. I guess I'm just wondering about that one, because the way you did it on the right means I have to do all this extra work as the consumer of these two functions. So I just, I mean, I end up doing it instead of you doing it in the single function. It, like, uh, where's the, like, what's the tipping point on that? That's a really interesting one. Um, I didn't fully thought through that. Oh, well, it's okay. <laughs> I, 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 I think no, it's, I think you have to do the extra work to figure out whether it is new, is true yes, or false. Yes, yes. So in, when he's talking about flags specifically, something on the outside has to already have figured out, is it a new user or not? So the consumer somewhere is already figuring out, is that a true value or a false value? So at least at that level, 
a valid point. That's, yeah. I, that's yeah. his point about and flags. That's what I was saying. going with, but I guess I'm taking your point as more of kind of like you're a consumer of like some kind of API, right, where you're just kind of passing in some values. Well, so as the user of one of these two functions, and, and I really think what caught my eye was this is a very specific function. It's not, you know, just like do something with my data and, and yeah. you know, like my generic data. It's very specific, and so I'm wondering, and maybe that's just what's throwing me off. But at the same time, like if this, I'm writing this function for you know my team or other developers to use. Which one of these would I actually write? Would I write save user, save new user? <coughs> hey, if I just wrote save user, you got to figure out if it's new or not. Just figure out which function to call. Whereas if that's determined in a, in a longer chain of things, I just pass it in. I didn't figure it out. It was given to me. Right. I don't want to figure it out again. And so I may end up, for the sake of saving other people time, write the function the way it is on the left hand. But I'm not having a talk about But it. I would kind of counter with that is <laughs> I don't know why you're like, like Christian was saying is <laughs> someone has to set is new right. and pass it in. Mm -hmm. So if I could imagine this function, it's like a what well, creator a classic creator update ORM kind of function where um, you you might pass if it was called creator update. Just pass in a user, and it would say, if user dot id is not null, <laughs> right? If you can derive it, it's not a flag though. That's yeah, right. It's yeah. part of the and those should still statement. arguably be calling two separate functions. So you might have a condition in there, but they're still going to point to two different functions under the hood, and all it's in responsible is for like what's called conditional polymorphism. Because where it gets even worse is when you have the same flag uh, condition twice. Sure. But you have to both get two of them, and then you even more. You have to think about that in different tree tools. Is it same principle? Like well, yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm just looking in terms of Redux. There's your problem. Some container right. way up there Actually, already figured this out for me. And I just, I've got a value. Sure or false, I don't know what it is. I just pass it. But even if you're, you're not computing it, you just, <laughs> you just decide. Even if you're not computing it, you're just kind of having like a function computer. that tells you whether or not it's new, you can still. This is what they're doing, actually. I see your point. But at some point, I'm, I'm writing, if it's new, save user, or save new user, else save user, when in fact. That's true. Yeah, that's true. But I guess the point is, you're doing that somewhere else. It seems to be conditional here. Then you're making save okay. user on the right. Because save user then, because it's not save user, it's determined, determined if the user, user is. is user and and it's determined if the user is, 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 is new and save user or do whatever. And the idea being you want your functionality. Yeah, you should name that function control. Or create. Well, those were my points. I don't want to use word because that would then show that you're using and fetch. So I think ultimately it's also going to come down to an object textual decision as to when do we actually know if this is a new user. So where does this code actually appear? And this actually goes back to the abstraction layer that I was kind of talking about. It should be one layer under it. So it depends on how you're going to call these. I think that's actually a really good point. Because if I'm, if I'm kind of getting all the data in, in basically one function, and so I, I'm returning the data in kind of this, we'll say, for simplistic reasons, or yeah, for simplicity, but say I have a main function, I'm getting the user's data in this main function, and then I'm basically figuring out there, that's the same level that these are operating on as that main function does. We've talked too long. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, there's your yeah. time. So really, I mean, when you're coding something like this, the only place where you can know for sure if it's a new user or not is at the interface level, right? Yeah, and so, yeah. Really, I mean, this what you're writing is essentially an officer method as opposed to a standard CRUD operation where it either adds something or it modifies something. So, really, what you've got on the right is just a pure CRUD separate the logic out of the method. And yeah. Just let the user interface decide. Where exactly. It is. Which one to call. Um, I, kind of the idea of, of it is that it does one thing and it does it well. It saves a new user well, <laughs> and it saves an existing user well. <laughs> Those were your rules you put up earlier. It's not saving something that doesn't exist. Oh. That's a I'll think about that. Maybe I'll end up a slide. Or not. Well, now you want comments. Now you want comments. Oh.
Okay, so just to sum up the comments I'm going to get into really fast, uh, I think this is a perfect. Um, I think this is a perfect way to sum up when you comment. Um, he runs the blog from C++. It's a really good blog. Um, but he says, imagine what you would need to tell someone who's reading your code if they were sitting next to you. That's what you put in your comments. So I'm going to go through some examples of comments and see how they can kind of be fixed or if just all together removed. I think the best comments are ideally no comments. You always hear like, oh, the best code is just self-documenting code. It's code that tells you what it's doing. Um, but I do, I'll get to when I do think comments are acceptable, but for the most part, I think the fact that someone's constantly commenting on something or writing a lot of comments, it usually means that the code is just unclear and it's pretty poorly written. Um, so I have some cases of you know poor naming and you're trying to explain what's going on. I have another example of your function is too large, you're trying to do too much. So one thing to avoid is college comments. Which are <laughs> 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 it's more just insulting to the reader. I mean, kind of going back to that first thing of like, oh, what would you tell someone who's you know who you're sitting next to, and like you're reading the code and they go, oh yeah, that's an if statement. I'm gonna check to see if the user can do this. And it's like, thanks. <laughs> I don't need you to tell me that the code tells me. I call these clarification comments because they're supposed to clarify something. And I think there's a way better way to do this. So if you see a comment like this, you're basically trying to explain, oh, it's checking to see if they have enough points. But this is a really unclear way of doing it because you're kind of just, you're writing the comment to do it. The code should do it itself. A much better way to do it is to say, is to kind of make a, I was also talking, well, a much better way to do it is just basically have a variable that tells you what it's doing, what it's checking. So that way I can tell if points is less than or equal to maximum points. And it's much easier than having to read a comment. Um, I think something else about that too is uh, the very first function I showed is that you had um, maximum or you had magic numbers everywhere. This is how you kind of get rid of magic numbers. You shouldn't really have hundreds or you know twelve. Like I don't know what that is, and unless you wrote the code, you're not going to know why that number was specific or special. So that should definitely be refactored into, um, and you should definitely not use a comment for it. It should definitely be refactored into some kind of constant variable so that I know this is not meant to be changed. This is the maximum amount of points that are supposed to be there. This is another one, too. Um, this one is basically the comment is trying to tell you what is trying to be checked in this conditional, right? So the user access level has admin access, and they're not temporary. They don't have temporary access, and they don't have an outstanding payment. Then go ahead and let them do it. And the comment is trying to tell you, oh, well, we're trying to see if the user can check the page. The best way to do this is this conditional, you can encapsulate it into a function on the user that lets you know what they're doing. This is much cleaner, and you don't have to have the comment. You, you can just get rid of the comment altogether. So you put the whole left side in the function? Yeah, I'm, I'm not actually, I didn't write out what the function well, would do, but the idea is that like, it okay. has permission of your page to be return user access level and all those conditionals that you have there as well. <coughs> So basically, he was it out. This is a really bad problem. I find it a lot of work. <laughs> okay, question. Don't Since you have co workers here, is this your code or theirs? Uh, neither, actually. Oh, <laughs> so I feel oh nice answer. answer. <laughs> uh, so, uh, this is basically uh, a really big problem. Uh, I want to see if, I think there are two major problems with this, but I, yeah. Right. So this comment has an and in it, so already this user's function is doing more than one thing, and they're trying to not say that it's doing more than one thing with the name of the function. Right. So obviously the function needs to be reworked already. For sure, um, yeah. The grammar's also in the way. All of my comments are ASCII diagram. Very visual, Joe. I, I think you made a really good point about this, which is that yeah, it's trying to do too much. So there's one of two problems here: either the save is doing more than the name suggests, it's saving and notifying them, or the comment is lying, and that's the worst. The comment actually isn't telling you what's going on. And so you just assume the entire time that, oh yeah, I'm saving uh -huh. and notifying the administrator. But even worse, like, people update code, but they rarely update the comments. And the worst is when the comments are lying to you. So I think in a, 
in summary, I do think that there are places that comments can be used. Um, I do think that if you're describing why you chose a certain implementation, that can be good information to someone who is trying to read your code, and maybe possible problems or pitfalls from this. Um, you could talk about edge cases that may have not been reworked, although you should probably rework them. <laughs> but if you do have problems, I think those are good things to go in comments. But for the most part, comments that just kind of clarify what you're trying to do or are trying to explain what this long, long block is doing really just need to be reworked. What about JS doc? Yeah. So I do. With us? Yeah, I am. Right. Right. I think that's a really. I mean, if you have like, if you have a, I think that's a really good point too. I mean, using like uh, JS doc or like Java doc or things like that, like that's a fantastic uh, tool to use because it can kind of help you understand what the user, or I'm sorry, what the author wanted you to understand about the function and what the parameters are supposed to be, any potential pitfalls of like, you know, edge cases that you could possibly have. So particularly so in an external API. Exactly. Right. Document auto yeah. generation. Yeah. You document probably don't want to do it with every function because you're just adding noise, but if it's an external API, it's super helpful. I'm a consultant. I have to like share my name my code. With my <laughs> well, sure. and your, your editor can help you then too, right? You hover over some other function. Assuming the docs are, doc string is up to date, yeah. it might tell yeah. you something useful. But if you have that last problem, then, then you're doing yeah, But I mean, sure. if you're maintaining a library, you, you should probably be on top of those things. Yeah. So just so you know, you have about 15 minutes. Cool, I'll be done. Um, so uh, another way to kind of sum it up is that comments should never tell me how something works, because the code's already doing that every time. And so this is another kind of summary of it. Um, think about why you're adding a comment before you write one. Um, if you're going to add one, think hard about why you think it's convenient. Most of the time, it kind of just means that your code is unclear and it should probably just be rewritten in a much clearer way. Um, one thing I like to do is I try to write code as if comments don't exist in the language. Um, so I basically, I'm, this is just something I do, I write my comments in a separate document <coughs> along with line files and I absolutely feel like it's necessary, I'll go back. Most of the time though, I don't actually need to do that. I can just kind of go back and be like, well, this could just be clearer. Um, this is just a really quick thing I want to talk about. I, I covered the main three points I wanted, but there is, um, kind of going back to my billiards analogy that I kind of had at the beginning, it's, um, I mean, a good billiards player kind of sets up the pool table so they're never taking crazy shots. And I think a good programmer designs the overall application that they're working on. What's so that billiards? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. You ever hear a pool? Yes, it did. <laughs> so, um, in the same way, I think a good programmer basically sets up their environment and the application that they're working on so that it's it's really easy to kind of just not have to make trick shots, but they're kind of just sinking balls really easily. So these are just kind of quick things that I felt like I wanted to mention, but I didn't really think I'd have time to go in depth to them. So um, you want your software to kind of be loosely coupled and highly cohesive, so um, people kind of put these two, the contrast cohesiveness of a program and the um, and the coupling of the program. The more coupled it is, the more that all the modules kind of rely on each other and the harder it is to kind of take them apart and it's hard to kind of glue other things into it. And it kind of becomes problematic when you're, I mean a lot of times software works by expanding and um, adding on to it, right? And if you're system is so fragile that you can't really add into it or add onto it, it's gonna be really difficult, especially if you want to kind of extend a feature or a current module you have and it's coupled with a bunch of other data. You only need about 20% of that, but you have this other 80%. So you either have to go back and pay the debt of trying to uncouple that 20% from the 80% or you're copying this giant module and you don't even need 80% of it. Um, configuration <laughs> data should be kept at a high level. Um, if you're kind of have all the information about your logger about like three layers deep in your abstraction. It's really hard if you need to kind of go back and fix that. Um, so keep configurable data at a higher level so that way um, you can easily modify the system so it kind of bends to your needs or if hopefully other people if they need to use it. And then two principles I think everyone's heard of is drive, don't repeat yourself. Um, that kind of goes with the uh, overall design of your program and keep it simple. Uh, the simpler the code is, the easier it is to reason about and the easier it will be for other people to kind of pick up where you were from. So, as a short summary of everything, 
how you write clean code, use descriptive names, don't try to be clever, minimize the amount of side effects you're using, think before you comment, and set yourself up and your team through success through well-designed systems that's expandable and don't make it fragile. That's it. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I love the example, I really love the example you have about maximum points is 10 and explaining why that is. And I think that is a, a great teaching point for mentoring others in the team as part of a, a code review. Um, because it's a really, when you see it, you're like, oh, duh, mm -hmm. right? But it, it explains why. And I think, to, to my mind, a lot of problems with unmaintainable code is it never explains why. I think that, to me, was the best example of the evening because it was so simple and so on point. Oh, well, thank you. Is there a question? No, I was just... Oh, was just, just, just comments and welcome. <laughs> yeah, so going back to something you mentioned in the beginning where functional programming versus object-oriented. How much of that you think is because of how JavaScript actually is versus if you were coding in Java or you know even TypeScript? Sure. Would um, you still say that the functional aspect that you mentioned would be the best approach? So um, let me know if I'm not answering your question. But um, can you repeat the question? So the question I understand it is. Um, does JavaScript kind of lend itself to functional programming in a certain yeah, way, as compared to something that's a really heavy, like object-oriented language? Uh, I think it does in a little bit. So the actual original creator of JavaScript was actually really inspired by Scheme, um, which is a functional language. It's a it's a dialect of Lisp, and so when he was making it, um, he basically originally made it as a very like Lisp-oriented, kind of like scheme-heavy implementation. They told them, well, you should really do it more C-like, because more people are much used to C programming or Java. And so he went, OK. So he kind of he didn't redo the underlying part of language, but he definitely redid a lot of the syntax and the way that it works. And so you definitely have functional elements. That's why like functions are first-class citizens in JavaScript, because it just, it just lends itself easily, because that's used everywhere in Scheme. Um, so I do think that. For historical reasons, there are some functional aspects that just kind of lend itself to JavaScript, and it definitely makes it easier as it paired to something like Java. I also think um, there's a really good post here, uh, functional programming C++. And um, I mean, while in JavaScript you can do some really fancy kind of, we'll say fancier functional type of like programming, um, I don't think it really encourages you, but it doesn't stop you from gaining benefits of programming in a functional style, which basically having pure functions and being able to reason about these in a very succinct and manageable way. Yeah. So um, a lot of the talk is on clarity um, and ease of reasoning or simplicity yeah. and I, I'm wondering how do you uh, are you familiar with like the distinction between easy and hard versus simple and complex I'm not okay so, so, yeah. so there's certain uh, I didn't I can, like ignore that dimension but uh, there's certain things which um, so easy and hard is kind of a subjective thing right it's like some people for some things some people will find certain things easier or harder some of that has to do with familiarity stuff like that in particular this comes up with functional programming where there's certain constructs where if you are not familiar with the paradigms it might be harder for you to reason about or understand or read than something which is more uh, like state mutation based or like more imperative in its structures and stuff like that. Uh, but it actually might introduce more complexity, especially when it comes to things like, you know, state mutation, stuff like predictability, that kind sure. of thing. Sure. So how do you think about that when you're like writing code in terms of like the people who are actually working with the code and it being harder for them maybe just because subjectively they're less familiar with the constructs, they're less familiar with the paradigm. Sure. I, I wholly understand where you're coming from. What's that? You had comments specifically for it. <laughs> <laughs> so, Does that I mean, make sense? It does. Um, and I, I understand where you're coming from with that. Um, so I definitely think that there's um, 
I mean, I tried to show with that first example of when you can kind of use, so people kind of label that like map map filter thing as like a functional style, right? And I definitely don't think that's easy for anyone, for anyone who's even good with functional programming. I don't even think that's an easy thing to read. Um, but I think um, what I wanted to emphasize, I guess with the functional aspect of it, is that when people talk about why functional programming is beneficial, they're talking about it because Mathematics is really easy to reason about, and we have a lot of understanding of mathematics and um, properties and laws that come with mathematics. If we can kind of model that as much as possible within a, like a programming domain by having things be as mathematically functionally pure as possible, then it's easier to reason about just like we reason about mathematics. And I don't think you need to know any of the crazier like um, constructs that come with functional programming, like monads, monoids, and functors, and everything like that. Like You don't really need to understand those things. And I also think it kind of comes to things with object-oriented programming, right? I mean, um, in a similar object-oriented space, I mean, someone who doesn't know, like, I mean, try taking someone who does JavaScript and being like, okay, so here's like this like five-level inheritance like Java object, go ahead and modify this. Like, that's also like, well, what am I looking at? Like, it definitely takes some easing into the water to get used to those things. So, I... Understand the structure. I'm sorry, what? It takes to understand the, the structure of the... It does, for sure. I, I hope I answered your question. Um, if I, yeah, I, I, I may just need to talk after a little more. About okay, cool. Yeah, um, but I, I definitely do think that um, it doesn't take away from the benefits you can get from object-oriented programming or functional programming either. You can, and that's why I also did, um, you mentioned like functional versus object-oriented programming. I, I think it's kind of a weird paradigm to kind of like battle them against each other because you can kind of, I think you can kind of play with them and some things it works better to kind of model your domain a little more object heavy and, and in another domain where you're just trying to modify data heavy, you don't really have to do a lot of objects and you can kind of just go like more functional stuff. Yeah. Um, I just had a comment on your naming things. I've run into a few times, like especially um, try to use names that the business people use as opposed to what the developers use. Um, because I've, had, I've got a kind of code base where basically people are selecting a drop down on the screen. Mm -hmm. and it's, in the code, it's all called category, categorization. But to the business people, it's coding. It has a specific meaning to the end user. So developers will come talk to the business people and they're like, so in the categorization, and the, the business people are like, what? What are you even talking about? So, the, yeah. so it's really helpful to try to use the words the business would use, even if it may be initially awkward for onboarding people. But then when you go talk to the stakeholders, you can use them some of their language, and you don't look like as big of an idiot. That's a, <laughs> that's a fantastic point. Uh, I've actually never had to change what they're calling me things. Yes. <laughs> yeah, good luck with that. Yeah, good luck. Well, well that's definitely yeah. right. Yeah. Just, just to give you a, the opposite example, <laughs> when you write in a code for one branch, and then the other branch calls it the reverse. <laughs> and then you roll the code out, and everyone starts talking. What are you talking about? The <laughs> exact opposite of what's wrong. <laughs> yeah. Is that where you put a comment in to say this is for? This is for you. I mean, that may be a good place to put a comment for something like that. I mean, especially if you kind of have like internal lingo. Uh, the main point I wanted to get like with commenting is think before you comment. Uh, but for sure, I think that may be definitely a good example, especially for someone who's new and doesn't understand like the internal jargon. Or like some business rule, right? That might be like, why is it five? You know, even if you make the comment, if you make a constant for five, there may be a business reason why five is the magic number. <coughs> For sure, yeah. 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 The variable name is because marketing said so. <laughs> <laughs> that kind of goes back to, because at that point, you're commenting to talk about the implementation about why five is important, not that five represents this magic number for. So think um, before you comment, and if you have to think, put a comment. Wow. You're doing it again? Well, uh, shut up, it's in the back, <laughs> shut up. You know, I was gonna say, uh, after Christian commented about like finding that kind of middle ground between what, you know, writing it all according to Hoyle and, uh, and also, you know, leaving some room for people to actually understand it because they didn't write it according to Hoyle. Uh, I am recently working with a very junior team and I find myself 
Uh, I, I, I like to think I follow most of these rules until they get stupid. <laughs> like once you, once, once you take all the, the perfect programming paradigms far enough, they become observables, and then it all turns to <laughs> shit. <laughs> so you have to stop somewhere before that. <laughs> I think all the way. No, no, no. I, I, I guess what I mean is, is uh, or my point was that I do find myself writing things that are very familiar to me and seem super clean. And then I go, yeah, but you know, Jimmy and Bobby and Billy going to see this, and they're going to ask me about it. And it's great if I can find the time to sit with them and tell them, like, this is why we do it. This is how you should do it. Blah blah blah. But a lot of times, little comment right there. You know, not, and it's not because Joe says so, but it's kind of. <laughs> I, I mean, I hope I, I hope it didn't come off as like a never write comments thing. But like, I think that's no, 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 no. I guess I'm saying like there, that's that middle ground that I tend to find, which is I may be writing a pattern that I'm super familiar with, or you know, it could be something I just learned, but I immediately recognize as more efficient than what I was doing. And uh, but I also realize that you know people need to review this code. People are going to work with this code on my team. Not all of those people are going to get it right away. Right. And again, my scenario is that I'm working with a junior team, and so I would find, like, I would look at it from their perspective and be like, "Where am I going to get tripped up?" And that doesn't mean a thousand comments. It means I can follow it. I can follow it. I can follow it. And here's the part where I'm not going to rewrite because it's perfect. Here's a comment. <laughs> <laughs> I, I also think there's something interesting about that because you're talking about like familiar patterns, um, and. Uh, I guess something I wanted to mention, but I never actually got to mention uh, in my talk was if you're implementing an algorithm, um, don't try to. I mean, for example, if you're if you're implementing a quick sort, don't rename low, mid, and high. Those are very commonly understood things <laughs> for a quick sort. So um, definitely, if there's a convention such as using I or low, mid, and high when writing a, a quick sort, go ahead and use those because those are fantastic. Uh, trying to make your own language for a quick sort is just going to add problems. Hey, Robert. Uh, so this is a somewhat loaded question. Sure. Um, <laughs> but uh, so a lot of these practices are very well received in like C sharp and Java and those communities. What has been your experience in the JavaScript world? In the JavaScript world? Yeah. Um, so I don't have a good answer for that. Okay. Because it's, 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 it's been very well received. <laughs> well, the, the loaded part of that question is I tend to find that JavaScript is the wild west. It is. People really don't like being told that what they're doing might not be optimal. Which is, so that's why I kind of put in that disclaimer, which is why I think it's really interesting in the case of JavaScript is because it's, it's true. there's so many options to do, like to write things in so many different ways, and so people will just write in whatever way they think looks cool or good without fully sometimes understanding like why some other people do it that way. Um, I'm not sure how, it, obviously I don't know how it's perceived, but like, um, I definitely get frustrated reading JavaScript code like that, for sure. Um, I guess that was part of my inspiration for it. Not just me, this is cathartic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, so thank you very much. <laughs>